Yes, finally. Look Sorry who it is, that. the famous Mike. <laughs> so, is your is your real name Cash? Yeah, it is. Pretty oh, hard to hate the guy named Cash, isn't it? Dude, I would give anything. Let's go. That's awesome. But, well, how's cool. your day going so far? Pretty good. Pretty good. I looked at your website. I went through your document. Um, you're crushing it. How how long have you been in business now? So I had a firewood company before this, and we got up to about 100k a month in revenue, and then I sold out of that. This one is about uh, two and a half years. And so just rough numbers. Um, we're doing about 1.8 to 2.1 EBITDA a year. Um, so pretty profitable. Um, and so right now, the goal is we do, I, I think I put in there, we do all cold SMS outbound. And we have super fucking high CAC to LTV. Um, and I, th- I was I was giving very, very conservative numbers. Um, when I put it on there. And so sales machines cranking, but we're very, very transaction. Um, so, you know, get a sale, do that, take the profit. And that's not going to get us very big. Um, and so the goal I want to get is to get at least 92% of these people re-engaged to a yearly package. I don't care what the package is, what we have to do to offer to them, whatever the market accepts, I will be cool with. And then I can legit legitimize the back end. And then from there, I can start ramping up the scales and actually grow this thing into, you know, something that's uh, probably in the eight figure EBITDA range. Um, But saying that I spent so long just getting the sales process down. And so my knowledge on subscription based stuff like that is very limited. And so I, while I've been reading up a lot, um, YouTube videos, I figured why not talk to the smarter guys than me? And, uh, that's why I'm here. And so the goal is to get about, uh, if I can get about 92% of customers on a subscription base and then keep my churn at a year at 10% yearly, those are number numbers I'm comfortable with moving to the next step and ramping up my marketing again. I'm sorry about that. Um, um, yeah. One thing I would uh, note, you might have, just in terms of projections, ten percent annual churn is going to be really, really low. Mostly just because of the, the the likelihood of people moving. Okay. We, we see we see about a twelve to fifteen percent churn of just because people move houses. Okay. Um, are you mostly residential or all commercial? Yeah, mostly residential. Yeah. So, um, we we like like literally, if we do no callbacks and no one's unhappy with our service, we'll still lose fifty percent of customers just because the average person moves every five years. Five zero or one five? One five. One five. Okay, okay. That's scary yeah. for a second. So we kind of look at it as a base case. So for example, if you said 10% annual churn, what I would recommend saying is actually 25%. Okay. Because you fit 15% of it is just gonna be people moving. And like during during COVID, it spiked up to like all of our churn spiked because people just kept mo- were moving all over the place. Yeah. So is there any way I you think I could put in some I'm guessing I could put in some uh God, my pens are screwing up some referral or something in there, because if I can get my churn down to about below 20% yearly, I can get another two spins on the the multiple wheel. And so I think that's um, something I, so have you seen, have you been able to do anything like that where maybe you get like 10% referrals and those get into, and then that drops, you know, something like that. It's like the referral engine kind of thing. Yeah. To reverse that churn rate. Yeah. Um, the bigger thing that we found is trying to upsell them or like really cross sell them into other services periodically, yeah. right? Okay. So just keeping them warm. And yeah. so it's like, Hey, I want to up like anytime I have one time project, I'm trying to cross sell them into recurring. Anytime I have recurring, I'm trying to cross sell them back into recur- uh, one time projects. And, and so. And you so, don't think that screws up like the valuing of companies um, like by having, because I know, I know they like to have below 20% yearly churn. And so by doing that, I mean, you can kind of offset and say, yeah, we have this, but we also do this. And then they kind of are, are cool with that. Have you found? Ultimately, they're looking for recurring revenue. Okay. Um, you know, obviously the lower the turn, the better, but like in this industry, I rarely see any recurring home service under 20% simply okay. because people move. Okay. And as soon as someone's moved, especially in your business, where like the grass keeps growing, we can upsell the following homeowner for you like if you do a big project and then sell some sort of warranty or ongoing service, a lot of times it's going to be a tough upsell into a new customer that are like that basically moved into the house. 
Um, yeah. You'd want to create some sort of program to kind of bring that down when people sell their homes. Like how do you do that transfer? But I would imagine a lot of your first customers are coming in from one-time projects. I see. I see. So what you're saying is the people that are valuing these companies, they understand, hey, you're going to get 25% yearly churn. And that's a good yearly churn compared to a software company. You know, they might they might get 10%. And so they, they understand the the nuances, I'm guessing. Yeah. If they're if they're I'm assuming you're kind of building this to sell to private equity. No, I just like to I don't really want to sell it. I really like to take it into something, you know, pretty massive. Um yep. But it's just kind of like a little stroke on my ego, like, oh, you know, I can value it here because I'm here. And so it's, you know, I, I'd always like to build it as if I'm going to sell it. And so that's kind of how I, how I'm thinking through things. Um, yeah. Like the reason I say that is because like the valuation in, in, in home services I've seen is like such a wide margin, even wider than like the software side. Really? Because like in software, it's very de determined by like monthly recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue, churn yeah. rates, et cetera. In home services, a lot of what's currently like the roll-ups that are happening, the valuations are skewed massively by who is the buyer. And right. so if someone's a strategic buyer and they're just simply trying to get a diversified portfolio of home service companies, they will have a much higher margin than someone that's just trying to like buy a local business. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so like, um, and, and same thing with like a lot of these companies that like HVAC, for example, um, you have a very balanced demand between summer and winter because you have heating and you have AC. Like in my opinion, that is why they've, they have massive in the past, like five, 10 years at private equity is just pouring money and their, their multiples have more than doubled. Um, and it is because they have such consistent cash flow throughout the year. Yeah. And then they just, they just automate it. They put technology behind it and the thing right. scales. So Sweet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That is, I know there's different, um, at different levels, you kind of get different multiple, but okay. So thank you for that. That way I have a better North star. So 25% is a cool one to look at. Okay. Do you think, um, just base broad overview, am I looking at things the right way, keeping my sales system to one time project and then cross selling them, or I could be doing it something better. Like I said, I'm looking at the long play, you know, five, 10 years out, um, and uh, I know that the only way to get real, real big is with these, you know, recurring. Um, so what are your thoughts? Am I doing it right? Can I do it better? Yeah. Like assuming you have an offer that you already know you can, you can sell for the recurring mm -hmm. side, then it's just a matter of like, where can you get a customer for the lowest, right? Like everyone's like, I want recurring, therefore I must market recurring. Not necessarily true if the pain point originally for the customer is your one-time project. Yeah. And so in your case, it's opposite of us. Okay. For us, everyone needs mowing. So we just go after them because I can get customers for 20 to 40 bucks. Yeah, and yeah. then I will upsell them into these bigger projects. For you, it is a matter of I am going to sell them this big time, big project, and then I'm going to cross sell them into the recurring side. Uh -huh. And then I would say, because the one time jobs, I would assume are literally one time in nature. They're not even reoccurring. Like every few years, it's it's probably like a one time thing, a massive tree, et cetera, or whatever. Um, I, I would really say like, once you move them into recurring, the goal is actually to then keep upselling them one-time projects. Well, dude, and that that's what I was thinking too, because, you know, if I can get them on recurring and say I can get like a 6K gross profit, because right now I'm at like a 4.5K gross profit per customer, mm -hmm. um, but I can adjust my pricing more profitable. I, that's, that's a whole different thing. But then it's like, there's so many other projects I can do. You can do Christmas lights and then I could really, really ramp up, um, that yearly value of that customer. Uh, okay. So let me ask you then this. So the that was the other thing I was going to say, Cash, is like I'd really be tracking your ACV, like your annual customer value as well. Uh -huh. um, because uh -huh. like, obviously, um, you know, lifetime value is important, but if you get your annual really accelerated, I think you have the advantage here because you, you can afford to spend so much more on marketing, which mm -hmm. allows you to scale this much faster. Right. Um, and so if you, you'll increase your lifetime value by adding recurring, but then you can, if you can add a second step, which is reactivating recurring back to one-time projects using cross sells of what other ever services you want to offer that increases the annual value dramatically. So, because tell me about the, the big North store, the, the five or 10 year plan out is if I could get something where, and I only serve the high end. So only, only, uh, eight fifty and up and then for some higher end areas like Austin, it's like a million too. And if I could get a lot like a 1% of this market to just use my service and it's like 
everything you need outside. It's like, okay, they have us on a basis. We trim their trees, bushes, like everything you could think of. I think that's where massive amounts of money could come in. Um, where it's just like, we do everything. And um, I, I read a book. There was a company like that that did all, all home maintenance. And they just had them on a yearly, uh, I'm sorry, monthly membership. And it was just like, if anything breaks in your home, we're there, you know, the 15th of every month, we'll fix it. Um, do you think that's kind of a, a correct, you know, far North star? My only concern with it is that it is easy to scale in terms of revenue. Um, oh. I don't see these companies usually being super profitable or okay. sellable. Um, the reason is because the amount of systems required for it to actually function correctly, it, 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 you, you add a lot of complexity. Um, like the person who's going to be the CEO or the operations manager for, say, an HVAC company looks very different than someone who's doing it for a tree company. He looks very different than someone who's going to do it for a handyman service. And so, so go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Like, like e e what I would probably do is look at each one of these as separate businesses and then probably just put them under a holding company. Right. So at that point, what you're going to be pretty much doing is you're going to be acting as a PE and company and just buying these companies. And then just saying across the board, I don't like how this fucking offer is. We'll run this. This will increase this and just, okay, that's cool. And what that's you're cool. probably going to do ca cash is because you, you're in this for the very long term, you're probably going to, like what you just said, and it's operate like a PE firm. I would probably, if I was you buy into the market. So you'd yeah. save two years on every single one of these acquisitions. Dude, yeah. Okay. That, that's so smart. That's so smart. So, you know, the reason PE gets away with buying out stuff is they, they know, like, for example, you, you buy a, a Christmas light company that does 500,000 annual revenue. You're going to buy the thing for 150, $200,000 from a distressed buyer. And then immediately you're going to take it from 500,000 to a million simply because you send an email to all of your existing database and upsell yeah. them into that service. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that that's for, thank you for that better North star. And so what, what I big goal is if I wanted to accomplish kind of what the big goal is, I could just have, you know, a PE firm that owns all of these. And so I could just have it where it's like, I could offer some sort of, you know, recurring basis. And it's like, well, it would work for me because if they need HVAC, well, I own 15 HVAC companies. They're all operating in the areas that I offer to. And then each one, okay, that, that makes a lot more sense. Um, and or like from an enterprise value perspective, that's if that's what you're trying to optimize for, getting it to be eventually rebranded under one is going to be the highest value, mm -hmm. right? So for example, um, one example that does more in franchising world is Neighborly, right? So they got purchased out by KKR, private equity, but Neighborly has about 15 brands that are completely separate in home services. But the alternative is if you had a brand name and it was just like tree service. So if you did, you know, superior tree company, superior Christmas lights, superior, whatever, that would also, that, that would be the highest value because you are actually rolling them up into one brand, which does have a higher valuation than keeping them separate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So let me tell you kind of the steps I'm playing at right now. So like I told you about two, let's just say two in a year of it, uh, um, because that's a lot easier than like 1.8 or 2.1. Uh, would you say that getting recurring revenue from these customers is what you would accomplish before? Because I can ramp up the marketing, but I don't want to, I don't want to have a very transactional business where it's just buy, sell, buy, sell. I want to have, you know, um, and so would you say, getting recurring is the thing I need to do or is it cross sales or, or what would you say um, before I, I, you, if I could. Yeah. Like I, I really think it's more of a cross sell situation. Okay. Um, and I will send you, give me one second. I'll send you a, an article. I was just reading yesterday. Give me one second. Um, so you don't think it's something where I need to offer these customers like a home maintenance yearly plan. Uh, home maintenance, like for everything right off the bit, bat you mean? I mean, not everything, but like, because I, I, what I do right now is we trim their trees, um, we trim their bushes, we put new mulch in, power wash, clean their windows, clean their gutters, uh, and put a fertilization, round of fertilization. And so we do pretty much a, a good amount of, of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was thinking if I could just sell them like, hey, would you like us to come back and do this every year? Um, there's a lot of this stuff could be done yep. every year. And I, how I would I would pitch it, um, cash here. Okay, I sent you a link there. Okay. That might be helpful. By the way, um, it's in the chat. But um, um, I would I would sell this as a price discount 
to go on subscription. So this is a big thing Amazon's done in the past year for basically every single thing that's consumable on Amazon. You'll see the little subscribe and save ten uh percent -huh. situation, um, and this is a form of cross selling, which is cross selling a, a one time into, into recurring. I would say, hey, usually this would cost you four thousand dollars. It's going to cost you three thousand if you sign a thirty six month agreement to be on this program. I see. And I would just be, if you nailed your sales process for the one time, bake it into your sales process to sell the recurring package. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking because I was like putting all this in my head. And then at the end of the day, I was like, dude, I'm just selling more, like create a better offer. And so I'd rather not do discount unless I absolutely have to, just because, you know, margins and profitability. But what if I could also do something where it's like, hey, you know, if you get us on a subscription base, we save time on marketing. We'll also give you you know, we'll hang up Christmas lights or we'll do this other thing. And the, the way I put it in my head is the the reason I was able to have such a good uh, CAC to LTV ratio is I just had a, as Alex Ramosi said, an offer people felt stupid saying no to. And mm -hmm. so I was thinking, well, if I can just do that again and just create a second offer that I can cross out and it's a subscription, that would, that made sense to me. Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I'll show you exactly. I'm just pulling up the offer we just created similarly. And it's essentially we don't discount, but we do show them the price change um, over the course of time. Let me just try to pull this up. So we do this for winter service, as we call it. Lock them in on a price. Um, let's see here. So basically what we do is we compare, hey, <clears throat> if we were to do this pro bono individually, here's the, the cost over here mm -hmm. versus we're going to do all this other stuff and it's going to save you 700 bucks. Yeah. So yeah. for you, you can just be like, hey, if you call us up, here's what's going to cost every couple of years. But if you just put us on the recurring schedule, we're going to, we're going to, it's going to be way cheaper and we're going to tack on those, these other extras. And you know, you can do that because you don't have to go send an estimator. You don't have to do all yeah. these other things. And plus I can just operationalize it um, too, which wouldn't be, okay. So you think, do you think if I could, do you think 92% to cross out of that is just, is that like, okay, that's something to strive for. That's going to be hard. Is that like, dude, you're fucking stupid cash. Like that's impossible. Like what? 92%, I would say you'd have to discount the initial. Okay. Um, so we've seen um, our best operators that can sell winter services. And this is like kind of the prime example. They're looking at 60 to 70%. Okay. Um, and, but that is without a discount. I would say if we went in and say, hey, your mowing price is literally going to be less if you accept this winter services thing, that would get us the 90% marker. It also require though you training your salespeople completely differently, like to get to 90%. Um, I think what, what has worked really well for us is when people come to you, they're not thinking about the recurring service. They just, they just have one problem. Get them through the problem and then just create a follow-up sequence that just like, Literally, it's like the walkthrough of the project becomes the sales pitch for the recurring service. Well, so what we do is we don't have any, we, all of it is by text. I mean, our whole sales yeah. process. And so it's really like, I mean, all of this is run by just one guy. Um, and so what I was thinking this I could do is I could just make another follow-up text sequence um, yep. and sell that. Okay. So 60 to 70%, if I had a really, really good offer. Another, another thing, Crash, okay. I just threw in there, I would probably uh, do a comp uh incentive for your project leads mm -hmm. if the person sells into the recurring package but we're all subcontracted yeah I, I would still still, oh, still, still i would i would incentivize essentially like basically if they do a good job and they've talked to the customer and made them happy you just basically say hey look i will do all the sales process i will sell them in this recurring thing and if they accept i'll give you a, a bonus dude that's so smart because then i could just say like i could um i could factor them into it too and then I could use them. Maybe they're like, "Ooh, yeah, that's looking real rough." Like you might want to get that checked out. And then, and when they when they do the the walkthrough of the project, they will just seed the upcoming sales conversation. And mm -hmm. so, if the customer asks questions about like continuing service, they're like, "Yeah, no problem." They're gonna text you. Just respond back to them, and they'll get you set up. Like they'll seed the sales conversation sure. because that's a really powerful moment to like the the highest point of conversion is that walkthrough when you've just finished their one-time project to convert them into recurring. That's like even, even more so than like an office phone call or anything like they, that. And they will co get colder and colder. The more time the minutes go. 
Yeah, because the the highest value to them is when they walk outside their property, the, the bushes yeah. are trimmed and the problem has been solved. That's the best point of contact in terms of timing for an upsell. Dude, I could probably work that in there too. So I could just have the okay, okay, I can do that. Um, so me, better looking metric. So if I can get 70% cross sale to a subscription package, that would be like, hey, that you have a pretty good offer set up. Like Phenomenal. that's okay. Yep. And then if I can get my churn my yearly churn on that recurring to 25 percent. that's like hey brother you're doing all right would you say yep. that's correct yeah and then you could basically say okay my annual value multiplied by four that'd be our 25 percent convert uh churn um would be you know uh, basically additional value tacked onto the one-time job okay okay and then so once i get that because the next goal i want to get to is about five million because yeah. I, I think about and then 5 million, so I went from 500 and tried to 10x to 5 million. So that's kind of the next step in stone. Then I'll go to 50. Um, you think if I can get these two metrics, 70 and 25, that will be a good enough back end that I can say, you know what, I'm cool ramping up. Um, I'm ramping well, up. Even at 75 to one, you, 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 you should pour money on this. It's more a matter. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, I get that. I just am scared that it's just like, okay, go on. Tell me why I should do that because I've always kind of... Well, like, again, I'm going to assume you're talking about like gross profit when we're yeah. talking to 75 to one. Yeah. So like anything more than a 10 to one, most people will tell you literally just like dump money on it. Because if you look at the return on that money, let, you know, if you say spend a thousand dollars and you know, you're going to get $75,000 back. And even let's just say 50% of that goes out the door to um, overhead. Like it's still a phenomenal return. Right. So like, there's no, like, if you have a 75 to one, most people would literally say, take out loans and dump money on it. Assuming that your backend can sustain, you know, in this case, your contractors can sustain that level of influx of work. Uh -huh. No, I mean, we could sustain a little bit. I mean, but, I've, but from a valuation perspective, what any investor would ask you is what's your confidence level that that 75 to one will stay throughout an economic recession and you creating a back end that has recurring revenue will fortify that. Even if you don't make increase that 75 to one, which I think you will make it even better by having a back end that's recurring because you're basically tacking on extra additional value to a customer. However, even if you didn't, just the valuation would be increased simply by the fact that you'd be able to answer that question and say, I have recurring revenue that even if they don't buy initially or that, that, you know, that, that, that arbitrage decreases, I'll still make money. So what you're saying is if this was your company, if you're in my position, you would be like, dude, forget the back end, just do what you're doing now and just do more of it. I would probably do that. Yep. Really? And there, I would, I would build the back end though, because it is, First off, you because you're subbing things out, you don't create any sort of more um, operational drag yeah. by you scaling. Right. Um, and so I would still build out the back end, mostly from the valuation perspective, as well as economic, like just like certainty. Because if, if, if a recession does happen, you that 75 to one will drop to 15 to 20 to one. And all of a sudden your, your cost per click, et cetera, will just double, triple, et cetera. And so to prevent that from putting, wiping out the business, having the recurring is a very smart move from a valuation perspective and just from staying in business. Okay. Okay. Um, so then at what point would you say to do, do focus on the recurring instead of just doing more? I would probably look at, as, as, as a few different steps. I do number one, like more, like, obviously you talk to, you know, Alex, like more and better before you talk yeah. about new, right? So I'd be doing more in that, like, can I keep dumping money on this? And when does my return start to diminish? Because if I can continue having a 75 to one, I should pour money on it. When that starts to decrease, then step two is I'm going to build a recurring. I'm going to build out and basically how do I sell more? So it's like better, like better ads, improving. Yeah, like yeah. How, how can I, Then it's more, which is going to be I'm going to sell them more services, I'm going to upsell them, et cetera. Then I would think about new, which is adding the more product lines, cross-selling them back into one-time projects like Christmas lights, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. like I would okay. probably just keep doing more of what you're doing if it's working until you, you saw a significant drop in that arbitrage. And then I'd be focusing on the back end. The cool thing is with your back end, the way you have it set up with operations there is no more operational drag to you to create the backend. Like literally in one weekend, you could create that backend. And because the only, the only operational drag is if it's like, 
dude, I have 30 subcontractors. Like, I don't even fucking know who's who anymore. Like, then it's like, okay. So what you're Hire saying- Hire an admin person. Yeah, you know? yeah. So you're saying like, if I could take this to five EBITDA, just by doing more of what I'm already doing, that's the route where you'd go rather than like, let me get the back end and then scale up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like you have something that's working very, very well. Okay. So I would pour money on that. I'd be stacking that money aside in it the is. event that you had you know, an economic issue yeah. um, because you don't have the recurring. But then I really do believe you could kind of do more and better at the same time, which is go ahead and build the back end. You could literally do this in probably a couple of weeks. You could build Dude, your I entire could. back end. And I live in like a 1.2K a month apartment and I have like multiple six figures just in the market. And so I'm very, very cash heavy. Um, and so in case, you know, if something bad happens, um, okay. So I should be looking more at like, how do I just do, I'm going to do this until I see, until I'm like, okay, this week we went down to 60, next week it's 50, next week it's 40. Or there's some other problem that I need to fix. But until until I'm seeing a CAC to LTV drop below, what would you say? I'd be 50. This is a benchmark. If you're at 75 okay. now and you're tracking it very consistently, it's mm -hmm. like, hey, when I hit under 50, that's when I start thinking about really pouring gasoline on this whole other aspect of the business. Okay. Um, I think you could do elements of the, the back end in terms of upselling into recurring. Again, without very much issue whatsoever. I would yeah. look at this as like, you could kind of do number one and number two simultaneously. I would just be careful about adding other services until uh -huh. the math doesn't make sense. So what you're saying is I could do, was I look at it more of like headspace um, because there's only so much, you know, my brain can compute. And so I was dedicating like 80 to 90% towards a back end, And then maybe like 20 to like, just maybe look, growing revenue and shit like that maybe reverse it and so it's like dude i'm just gonna put 80 percent on here and then you know i'm just gonna test you know an, a cross sell because i already have you know four new jobs going on a day i'll just test a cross sell every day i'll make one and tweak it like something like that yeah and i think i think from a mind space perspective the upsell like the, the back end of creating the recurring I genuinely believe if you just said I have to get it done this week, you would get you would get it done. And I mean, like yeah. from some from start to finish, the texts, making sure the contractors are incentivized and you have a program to to track that. Like I genuinely believe in creating the offer, creating the package to be able to sell customers. Like I genuinely believe in one week you could build the entire back end. And that would get 70%, 70 percent? At least fifty. Like if you build okay. your offer correctly and you have the tools of like knowing yeah, what yeah. a good offer looks like, I genuinely believe that you could almost do that in a week. Dude, I bet I could do it in a day. Like if yeah, I really I'm, sat down, it's just yeah. like, this is what I'm doing. Like, it's not that fucking hard. Yeah, especially uh, because okay. you're not doing new. If you're doing yeah, new, yeah, you yeah, add yeah, a yeah. whole other layer of complexity. Yeah. That's why I just put that on the shelf. Like, I'm just going to keep selling more and then taking what I've sold them and sell more of it over the course of time. And I could just rework how I'm wording it, how I'm doing it. Like, okay, dude. Okay, this is so clarifying, Mike. This is so worth it. Um, Okay. Then in that case, so let's talk about scale. So right now we have uh, four subcontractors. Um, I can probably, honestly, to get to five, I could probably just tweak pricing, try get you know the perfect pricing. Um, maybe add one more contractor, stuff like that. So that's what you're saying. I should be focusing on. And then like, how do I maximize? And then at that point, once I get to five, if my CAC to LTV is still there, then I thought just like- Just pour gasoline on, just keep going. Well, what I was thinking is this, Mike, I was, I was like, I was talking to people that are a lot smarter than me, probably like you. And at that point, maybe I could find someone. It's like, okay, you're gonna, I need you over the next quarter to hire, you know, 20 new subcontractor teams. Like this is your job and to manage them. Okay, here, this is, we need to be sending out this many messages. And hire people that can do that because I know at about, I think at 5 million in profit, actual coming in, that's 400K, about 100K a week. That's enough money, I think, to, you know, bring on some people. Um, would you say that is an astute thing to do or would it be, um, you know, at, at 5 million EBITDA to bring on some people to try to jump to that 50 mark? I like I like the fact that you're waiting to 50 until five, because uh -huh. at that point I would go hire an absolute savage. Someone yeah, that's literally done this before. Yeah. They've ran a subcontracting model, not for a $5 million company. We're talking about someone who's already taken from five to 50. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you can afford it if you get to the five without having to go get the op that 
that cost, right? It's like, I'm in this phase now. It's like, okay, like I'm hiring people that are like multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but the level of skill that's different than yeah. from them compared to the person like you had to like manage and like tell them how to do things. Like if you tell the right person, Hey, I need to get 50 million and I need you to go get 20 new contractors for something like, yeah, no problem. I'll get it done. Or and you say, literally hey. leave them alone. You don't even have to give them like how to's. They just yeah. know how to get it done. Right. I would recommend that. And I'd recommend doing that at the 5 million marker. Cause then, then, then I would give you license knowing that that's being taken care of. Be like, okay, now I can go focus on new and like creating these other verticals, whether it be buyouts and rolling right. people up, whether it be just cross selling into other services, hey. et cetera. Okay. So get to 5 million and then I can, hunt. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Does that 5 million, and I've keep things very lean, both business side and personal side. I was like, then I feel comfortable and I can bring on a guy that's 450. And that's, that's, you're going to get a pretty fucking heavy hitter for that much money. Um, okay. And just okay. go on LinkedIn, just go LinkedIn. LinkedIn will bring the best applicant for that, for that role. So when, and we can talk about that once I actually am like, Hey, man, I'm at five, you know? Mm -hmm. cool. uh, okay. So Yeah, that, that's clarified me so much. Um, and then at that point, uh, so just keep doing more of what I'm doing, figure out how to get to five. If at any point I get below a 50, then work the back end to try to get up to try to get to these metrics of 70 and 25, and then go back to pouring gasoline unless, you know, I'm now at a 35 or something super silly like that, right? Yeah, I, I, I do believe you can build a lot of that back end without too much uh, much drag, so even if it's only 50% conversion or even 40%. But like, that'll be huge. And I think the, the return for your time is huge. Like, so, for example, we could go get more contractors and grow yeah. to, to five. Or you could literally just do the back end part that takes you a week and all of a sudden double your annual value per customer and get there that way. And and the other thing is just testing pricing. There's, I mean, there's, there's plethora of ways I can do it without just going on a hiring phrase. And I could probably do it maybe with, with five guys. Um, okay. Um, that's a lot easier problem to solve than figuring out a back end. And so what I'm thinking is I can just get a back end, um, get a back end done and then just maybe one or two hours a day. Okay. What was the past day? What was the conversion rate on that? Okay, wink one improvement, test the next day. And they take one or two hours. And yeah, what do you think about that? You know, the, the arbitrage wasn't 75 to one, but it was say 40 or 50 to one. Huh? I think having a secondary lead source would be very beneficial to the valuation of the business because you are at risk if that's your only channel. Well, and that's something I was thinking about. But um, Alex and then Neil, you went to it, didn't you? Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think we maybe know some of the same same people yep. in our same circles yep. but i think because they mentioned you and they're like oh yeah um but they both said that i should look into that once i get to about a million a month and since i'm um i'm, I'm yeah. about seven million i'm just yep. very, very I'm, I'm mostly thinking like down the road a little bit yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah in yeah. terms of valuation right like yeah. again and like if you're just trying to extrapolate cash who cares like take it while the good you're going is good but if you're trying to look at valuation like that's my thought is just a matter of what are the questions that investors are going to ask? And it's like, are you a, are, are you a risk? Is the channel a risk? Do you have recurring revenue? So like, as long as you're checking those boxes and you're already thinking about it, that's good. Well, that's kind of how I think of it. Um, because even though I really want, I don't want to sell, I'd rather just, you know, because what else am I going to do? I'd probably end up with a <laughs> problem and you know, I had, if I had a bunch of money and nothing else to do. Um, so I kind of just think of building a company that's valuable. But let me ask you this, Mike, what do you, what do I not know? I mean, based on like, you're high level to me and you've answered like all of my questions. So thank you so much. But what do I not know? Like, um, I know that's kind of a broad, but what do you, what do you see me? Yeah, I think, I actually think you have the skills to get to 10 very easily. Um, more of what you're doing is, is basically going to get you there. And the thing you've talked about 10 so far, or 10 rev, 10 revenue. Okay. Um, like I think that that's, that's, um, a no brainer. I think the thing that I'm learning to go from 10 to a hundred and uh -huh. you will you'll get there probably pretty quickly uh -huh. is um recruiting and it is getting people yeah. to basically take the entire thing that you're currently doing and do 100% of it so you get to move on to level 2 yeah and and that that's a different skill set cuz it, now it becomes like how do i attract someone that has plenty of job offers they've done this before um uh, but how do i get them involved what do i give them pieces of equity do i give them options do i like that that becomes a whole other skill set um, and it is a skill set. Like, how do I recruit yeah. people? Like, not just workers, not contractors, 
executives, right? Because I think, right, I think by the time I get to five, I'll probably be at about five EBITDA. I probably will be at about eight revenue. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm running at 60% net. Uh, yeah, so that, that sounds right, five to eight. That sounds, that yep. sounds about normal. And then- And I genuinely believe like doing more of what you're doing, yeah. like building up the back end will probably get you to 10 million revenue. Dude, yeah, yeah. So what have you found? Because you're playing, you're playing 10 to 100 with Augusta or, or what, just your whole organization or what? Well, that would be my revenue. Like I'm not counting the, the franchise system. Um, okay. Like my revenue personal... for Augusta or for kind of all, all of it combined. Okay. There's three okay. entities. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard you like own a gym too, right? Oh, that's like, yeah, that's more that's just, just to learn from. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know if that was just something, you know, you could make 20% on your money there instead of, you know, 12 in the market. Or you something. know, I, I got that one before starting the franchise at Augusta just to learn the process. Yeah. So, yeah. So how have you been doing recruiting people? I mean, just how, yeah. how have you been doing that scale? Yeah, so your vision like has to be big enough for them to fit their vision inside of, right? It's looking like a true Hermosi fan. Yeah, like you, it, it, but it's so true. Like even over the past like several months, as I've yeah. been getting like very high level um, engineers, for example, engineers like they the, the person that you're trying to recruit could go work at Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how are you going to compete with that? The only difference is you're you're not going to get on, on compensation. You're not going to get it on benefits you're not going to get on like workplace culture like how little they have to work you're asking them to work crazy amounts of hours so like the only thing that's going to differentiate you is going to be like what am i trying to accomplish here right you and that's the biggest thing like the like the even mission more oh yeah oh yeah if you get someone that actually buys into the mission they'll work the crazy hours they'll do whatever it takes to get across the finish line whereas if you're just doing it based upon like hey i can top out your current offer at facebook will yeah. you come work for me you'll get a decent person with a lot of skill but they aren't going to have the work ethic that you think they will need because like you're used to hustling all the time when you move on to the next role and you give that off to someone else like you will expect that same level especially when you have a very large salary you're, you're paying them yeah. And so the only way, in my opinion, to do that, to get the person to give discretionary effort, which is like after hours on the weekends when stuff's breaking, they hop in after hours, that discretionary effort only comes because they believe in the vision. Yeah, and yeah. so like it, determining why you're doing all of this, like what is the end result, whether that be we're going to sell, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, giving something outside of money have it as a mission is super valuable. So for me, I get everyone to buy into the fact that like 60 to 70% of home service business owners don't make any money. I think we can solve that with software and robotics. And here's what we're going to do for the next 20 years to fix this problem. And so, so that's, okay. I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mike. Go on. No, no, you're good. But but establishing what that is for you and then selling that, like you become a salesperson for now. Like recruiting, recruiting is sales. Okay. So that's the game you're playing because I've seen your software. So is that the, is that y'all's biggest revenue source The and the Augusta's kind of um, like, what are you focusing most of your time on? Are all three they're, separate? They're all very synergistic, like the media, okay. the software and the franchise. Like they okay. have to work together and eventually we'll take them all public together because they're yeah. very synergistic. Um, like I need you know, 70 people back here at command center for Augusta to be able to one day run the, the robotics for our franchisees that we will have a competitive advantage with. I need the software though, to run that hardware. And so it'll all kind of more or less come together, but like having that 20 year vision or even a 10 year vision is what gets an executive, like someone who really has skills, very excited. Cause that's why they're leaving their other high paying job. Yeah. So you're, you're saying like the game you're playing you're trying to get people just like, hey, listen, we're trying to revolutionize and just make sure I'm on the right page. We're trying to set it up so that, you know, in 10 years out, all of lawn mowing will be uh, robotical. Is that kind of one of the plays I'm guessing you're making? Based well, on what you said? We know that like the cost of labor will continue up. Yeah. The effectiveness of labor will continue to go down. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the cost of robotics and technology will continue to go down and its effectiveness will go up. It's like yeah, eventually this crosses. Yeah. Um, I think that the person that takes advantage and rushes the market and, and it is very, very fragmented. Like there's 600,000 landscapers yeah. in the US. Like the person that will eventually take 10 to 15% of the market, which no one has, will be the person that has the software that meets the hardware of the robotics when that cost comes down enough, but then also has the distribution. So the distribution for us is the franchisees. Oh, that's so smart. I see the game you're playing now. So how do I play that? Say I want to get into the billionaire boys club. How do I play that same game with what I'm doing? I mean, what am I figure, missing? 
figure out why you're doing it and then reverse engineer the whole thing. So like, mean, why? So for example, you want to be a billionaire. No one cares. Yeah. Yeah. So like figure out something that is going to then lead to quote unquote, the billionaires club. There's a mission big enough that if accomplished would get you there. Like as a result, yeah. like that's a result yeah. of okay. like money is just a byproduct of creating value. Yeah. So like, if you want, like, I want to, I want to be able to have X amount. That's an outcome. Like now we just have to work back to the inputs and like the input is create so much value to people that they're willing to give you a billion dollars. Yeah. No one, nobody's going to come work for me because I'm like, Oh, I want to have a house in Monaco. Okay. okay cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so I see what you're saying. So I need to figure out what I would need to accomplish and just say, I want to be the go-to place that, ha- that customers can reliably, that affluent customers can reliably count on for all of their exterior and interior home services, something like that. And that's something people would say, I could, I could play ball with that one. Like that seems big enough and cool enough that, and I feel like I'm actually working towards something rather than just, you know, uh, increasing how profitable Facebook's ad platform is that kind of the game you're. Yeah. And like, you know, you want to be careful too, because like most people are not going to cheer for the affluent person. Most people are not going to want to solve their problems. And so it's also a matter of like, how do I help the underdog? Right. So like really finding a problem, like if someone who's affluent, whether or not it costs them a thousand or $5,000, doesn't really matter. They can find the contractor, but if you said, Hey, I want to solve the problem that customers have multiple vendors and they have to disrupt their day and take away from time from their family in order to get all these random vendors that they don't trust or like and aren't insured, aren't professional. I'm going to solve that or a one-stop shop. Like creating that solution for the average Joe is the thing that, that creates the brand that people want to buy into. Yeah. Okay. Like, so for example, because we're both using Alex, for example, like, like they make money on their portfolio. Right. There's like only like 10 to 20 companies, yeah, but great. the, the idea of making world-class business education accessible to everyone is appealing to the average Joe. Right. Right. And so they get their team to buy into that vision. The money maker is the, is the portfolio. So you don't think people, you don't think people would just, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Because the people that are buying into the money vision are just going to be like, well, this people offered me 550 or offered me 450. Like, and that's not who you're wanting to work. Right. I see what you're it saying. It depends. Like if you're just, just want money motivated people, great. But realize you're going to be competing on price in terms when of hiring that talent. If someone offers, you know, more money and like. And then yeah. it's, it's also a matter of like over the course of a couple of years, like as you make more money, you will usually tend to like start thinking like, hey, why am I doing this? What actually is motivating me? And you start boiling it down and down and down. And then you get to the root of it. Yeah. Right. So for me, it was like, I started in lawn care. It gave me everything I've ever known. It got me like to where I'm today. And I want to give that to as many young guys as possible. And yeah. so whether it be the books, whether it be the videos, everything just ties back to that one thing. And I know as a byproduct, I'll be fine financially. Yeah. And so I think I would do some work, like just personally, like asking yourself, like really, okay, so I want to be like, why? Okay. Well, why? Like just keep asking why enough and eventually just boil down to like, well, actually like, you know, I'll just make an example. It's probably not pertinent. But like, I'm tired of having like, um, you know, I hated, I hated my virgin, I hated being a having a job that I hated, and I hated uh-huh. not being rewarded for the job that I did. Right. I, I, and that's why I became an entrepreneur. And so you just boil it down enough towards like, oh, I want to create as many jobs as possible to be able to give people a place where they can make as much money as they want. Right. Right. And they create something there that is a is a finish line that's worth fighting for besides I, I get- just money. I get that so much. And I know we're running out of time. So I'll say this last thing. Um, so it's like when when Musk was getting people for SpaceX, he said, we are going to be uh, the new NASA or something along the lines of that. And so people that are like, okay, I will come work here for maybe even less money than Facebook because all I'm doing at Facebook is just nothing of value. But here I am doing something. His and goal, so, like, his goal is large enough to where he actually doesn't think he'll hit it in his lifetime. That's yeah. getting to Mars. He doesn't think it'll, it'll get there. Like uh-huh. ma- making a space bearing uh, civilization on Mars. He he generally, he said in interviews, he likely won't see it in his lifetime. Yeah. And that's what buys in people was they're like, you know what? That's something I can, I'd work my life for. Yeah. Dude. Okay. Mike, you know, I got to tell you, man, thank you so much. I know you have a million things and this has been some of the best money I've spent in a long time. So Good stuff, thanks brother. brother. I love you, man. Best of luck.
I'll call you again once I hit that five. You got it, man. See you, buddy. Take care. All right, bye-bye.